Harvester Games, my love. For you, I have sunk many an hour playing, replaying, analyzing, editing, decaying. Yeah, so last year I did a video series where I talked about all of the Devil Came Through Here games. And every time I did so in agonizing feature length detail. Thank God I'm not using that video format anymore, I almost died. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Harvester Games, which is mostly just one guy named Rem Michalski, are the creators of Downfall and Lorelei, but they are by far most well known for The Cat Lady, a game about a suicidal woman being forced through a second chance at life. And yeah, all of their games are that grim. But if The Cat Lady is Harvester at its gloomiest, Downfall at its angstiest, and Lorelei at its straight up darkest, then their first standalone game, Burnhouse Lane, is Harvester at its most tragic. Hey kids, has anyone ever told you that we're all gonna die? You know, we talk a lot about death in our media, but I don't know if we could ever talk about it enough. Like, it's possibly the biggest existential elephant in the room ever. Most of us are lucky enough to put it in the back of our minds for 80 years while we enjoy the simple pleasures of our meaningless existence. But there's another kind of person. The kind that is forced to confront the reality of death every day. <coughs> Burnhouse Lane is the story of Angie Weather an ex-nurse who takes jobs as a live-in carer for elderly people. Angie's story is one of grief, isolation, and mortal terror. It's a story with a lot of characters, a lot of loss, and a lot of dire situations. I haven't seen anyone talk about this game yet, despite it clearly needing the old video essay treatment. But I have a lot to say about it, so we better just jump right in. Yeah. It's time to talk about Burnhouse Lane. Hi, Angie. It's Tracy from the agency. I have good news. A job's come up, and it's a big one, just like you wanted. The game begins with a call from Angie's agency, offering her a job taking care of an old man on his farmhouse. But Angie refuses. And what follows is a very dismal and uncomfortable opening sequence. Because it basically has us controlling Angie as she prepares to kill herself. Man, if anyone watching this isn't familiar with Harvester's past work, welcome to the club. You know, my knee-jerk reaction is that this intro is a little gratuitous. But we've seen so much suicide in these games that you'd think I should be numb to it by now. I think it's that the player is literally the one walking her step by step through the process, and I feel like that's just kind of unnecessary and a little bit yikes. I don't see why this couldn't have just been a cutscene. But as Angie's life slips away, we learn why it has come to this. These last two months have been the best months of my life. Will you marry me? A nurse falling in love with a patient? God, no. Marrying a dying man? I never understood why she did it. Japan? Are you kidding me? Of course I want to go. I'm afraid the patient is not responding to the treatment. James really shouldn't be traveling in his current condition. I'm sorry, but I can't allow it. Angie... I'm... sorry. He was... James was a great guy. I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry for your loss. <gasps> it's a nasty cop, Angie. <coughs> Should go have that locked out. Are you okay? You look a bit... pale. I have bad news, Mrs. Weather. Worst, I'm afraid. It's lung cancer. 
late stages. Maybe if we found it sooner. But at this point, it's so far gone, there's nothing we can do. I'm sorry, Mrs. Weather. We cannot cure your cancer. You have about six months left to us. Fortunately, Angie's attempt fails, and she decides to take that farmhouse job, where she meets old man George. Her tasks mostly consist of watering the plants, feeding the horse named Richard, and making George sandwiches. Mmm, a lounge version of the cat lady theme. Love to see it. Speaking of, Angie is also treated to the company of several cats who wander around the farm. Hello? Now, Angie plans to save up the money from this job and go to Japan in her final days, just as her husband James would have wanted. But then, something unexpected happens. Angie finds a strange door in the basement, and somehow she finds herself stepping onto a city street, the titular Burnhouse Lane. So? There's our premise. We get to dual wield realities, uncover mysteries, and come to terms with our death. I know that's how I like to spend my Sundays. The first resident we meet on Burnhouse Lane is a guy who runs a kebab shop named Omar. He gives minimal information on how Angie ended up here before sending her off to fend for herself. Occasionally people like you stop by this place. They always ask questions, try to understand. They say, where are we? Where's everyone else? Why me? But I don't have any answers, and I'm not even interested in finding them. It's funny, but you all smell the same. No offense. What do you mean? Smell of what? Sickness. Also, he keeps his girlfriend consensually chained up in the basement and constantly feeds her kebabs. Joe vibes. Angie is quickly acquainted with the dangers of Burnhouse Lane, like Omar's ex-girlfriend, Destiny. Oh. Well, this looks like... someone's fetish. I guess that's the point. Omar has informed Angie that she must find a cat if she wants to get back to George, because they are the only ones who can slip in and out of the two worlds as they please and find a cat she does. Yes. I think you might actually have a chance. This is the burned cat. He used to be a normal house cat, but one day he followed his owner to Burnhouse Lane when they both died in a house fire. He knows of Angie's sickness and offers to help her defeat her seemingly inoperable cancer. You must prove something to me first. Prove it to yourself. I'll give you five tasks. Okay, I'm gonna try and keep Double Came Through here references to a minimum. After all, this is a standalone game. But yeah, Angie does kind of feel like a Susan Ashworth 2.0. She's sad, she has no friends, she had a failed suicide attempt, she used to be a nurse, she makes friends with cats, and she has to complete five second chance giving tasks, which you'll come to see also mostly consist of offing weirdo serial killers. After all, your first task is to make an evil man come to Burnhouse Lane where he will pay for his crimes. But you know, the comparison is neither here nor there. It's okay to have a type, and I'm not gonna complain about playing as another sad cat lover. Anyway, the burned cat sends Angie back to the farm, and you'll kinda have a chance to regroup and save here after every chapter. In the second chapter, we meet a few kooky characters like Kieran the Alcoholic Shepherd and Father Rob the Creepy Priest. It turns out that Father Rob came to the farm because he usually gets drugs from George's old caretaker, and he knocks Angie out when she won't tell him where her meth lab is. This has more significance to the plot than you would think. 
But anyway, Angie is kidnapped, and she has to confront Father Rob in his murder sex dungeon before he murder sexes another victim. And this is where we meet Jenny, an American movie star who Rob drugged and kidnapped in hopes of making her his sex slave. You're Jenny Wilde, the actress. Yeah. And who the fuck are you? The two then lure Rob into a trap that leads him to Burnhouse Lane. And this is kind of how every chapter goes. Angie makes a friend, they give her information on whatever serial killer she's going after, Angie confronts the serial killer, her new friend dies, and she ends up back at the farmhouse. Only Jenny is lucky enough to survive and become a major character. You know, I feel like the serial killers are kind of the least interesting part of the story. Like, I don't really know why they took that angle so hard. I mean, they don't even really represent anything about Angie, like, they're just kind of there. The parts of this game I found myself truly invested in were mostly scenes at the farmhouse. Like, after the Father Rob incident, old man George lets Jenny live at the farmhouse until she feels strong enough to go back to LA. And there's this whole little section where we see Angie kind of taking care of her. It's really sweet, and it actually sets up some harrowing scenes later on. And in one of the story's most charming moments, Angie finds George sitting on top of the barn in the rain. Depending on how you play, Angie can just sit next to him and listen to his story. It was the 4th of September, two years after Dad had passed away. I was on my tractor, heading up the hill to mend the fence, when I heard a crash. I stopped, suddenly. I got off, and I saw this bicycle, all crumpled up, sticking out right from under the tractor's front wheel. And I saw a lady's foot. Well, I had no idea at the time that six months later, we would marry that foot and its owner and that it would be the love of my life. Penny opened her veterinary clinic here. Then Sarah was born and we started a family. Life was good. But good lives don't last forever. They're always followed by the dark times. There was an accident one day. We had a lot more horses here back then. There was this one bad stallion. Derek, he was called. Nasty old thing. We had jumped and kicked Penny suddenly while she were giving it injections. And she just flew and hit her head on the wall. She didn't die straight away. I was in the hospital with her for three days, watching the life in her slowly drain away. She was only 42. That's too young to go. Too young. But hey, look at me rambling on. And then he vaults himself like 30 feet into a haystack. What a fucking legend. I love George. He's like the best character. Another very real down-to-earth moment comes after one of Angie's allies is killed in the middle of one of her tasks. Angie laments that it should have been her who died, and here she reveals to her friends, I have cancer. I'm dying anyway. You? What? No way. You're shitting us, right? I wish I was. Damn. I don't know what to say. There is nothing to say. And from here on out, it's gonna be pretty hard for me to talk about the story without revealing what happens in the second half, so consider this your official spoiler warning. Now, around chapter four, things start changing. This time, the monster of the week is called Bloody Mary, an ex-nurse who used to steal blood bags and drink them. And yes, she has a body count. There's a man in Mary's house who she's holding prisoner, and she's cut off all his legs. So it looks like he's going to be this chapter's disposable ally. But the thing about this guy is, he's also been to Burnhouse Lane. 
He used to be a barber, and he still runs a shop in the other world. Ben asks Angie to visit his shop next time she's on Burnhouse Lane, and interestingly, he hallucinates a giant spider right behind Angie. See, Angie hates spiders. They're like her mortal enemy, but we'll get into that later. Eventually, Ben dies and Angie returns to Burnhouse Lane. She runs into Omar again, who says he's closing up shop after the escape of his latest girlfriend. There's no one here that needs my food anymore. I feel like I should leave, but I don't know where to go. You can't just give up, you know. I'm not giving up. I've been defeated, and I've accepted it. What else can I do? I can see things clearly now, and I'm okay with all of this. I must go. We must all go, in the end. Look at Omar's stupid fucking drink labels. You got your choice here of shite, vodka, and dick. Jesus. So Omar directs Angie to Ben's shop, and then this happens. Now, take a deep breath and let it all go. Surround yourself with sweet nothingness. It's cold here and it's dark, but it's a good kind of cold and a good kind of dark. You knew this would come. The moment you start to fade is simply the preparation for what's about to happen. The parts of who you once were begin to crumble and fall like an old tape. And you realize I'm sorry, Angel. I'm so, so sorry. I had to do it. Forgive me. Anyway, after Angie finishes her business with Bloody Mary, she falls asleep on the farm and is awoken by Kieran, who says that something's wrong with Richard the horse. Oh, please, nurse, do something. Make him better. I'm sorry, Kieran. Rich is gone. Gone? But how? Why? He was fine yesterday. What if I, I just thought you remember to feed Richard every day, did you? And this is the part where you realize Oh shit! I killed Richard! Now, to be fair, Richard dies regardless of whether you feed him. But the guilt hit me hard on my first playthrough. And that's not the end of this grayscale day of woes. What are you doing, George? Tell Steve that we're going tomorrow, will ya? We need him to get everything ready. It seems that Richard's death may have triggered a sort of flashback in George. If you use up all the dialogue options, it becomes clear that George used to have a son. A sort of troublemaker who would always butt heads with George before, ultimately, he took his own life. Steve? Steve! No! You had your whole life ahead of you, Steve! That didn't have to end like this. You, you always had it in you. This darkness, this stupid desire to destroy yourself. The son? No. Oh, he never had a son. And even worse, Jenny starts to show her true colors after her overwhelming gratitude wears off. But that's because I'm young and adventurous. Finish your sentence, Jenny. Oh, forget it. No, say it. You're just... not a lot of fun, are you? She's experiencing withdrawal symptoms from some drug and is trying to break into the very same lab that Father Rob was looking for in Chapter 2. On our next trip to Burnhouse Lane, we even see strange versions of Jenny and Kieran in a wax museum. Kieran's just kind of there, but you can actually engage Jenny in conversation, and she starts to reveal that she's a lost cause and 
kind of an asshole. Shortly thereafter, Angie is picked up by this weird slimy guy and placed on a meat hook. And it seems like this might be the end for her. James. This, to me, is one of the best moments of the game. We finally get to see this closed-off, bad bitch Angie kind of break down as she fully allows herself to be vulnerable and realize the terror of her situation. I'm scared, James. I feel like I'm losing my mind. I used to pretend I was strong. I tried to be there for you. To support you. But when you died, it felt like I died with you. James escorts Angie to the burned cat and disappears before Angie has a chance to notice. And now, Angie can receive her final task. You must tell someone the whole truth about yourself. The good and the bad. And all the dirt. Like you would to a best friend. If you had one, of course. But you can't hide anything. It won't work if you do. Yeah, it's a bit ironic that Angie needs to lose the baggage of her looming death in order to magically avoid her looming death. But the cat says that afterwards, a man named Mr. Fox will come and help Angie find her reward. And then, Angie reunites with Richard and rides him back to the farm. I remember seeing a clip of this in the trailer and thinking it looked so goofy, but this scene is actually really cute, and it kind of leads us into the third act of the game. Back at the farmhouse, Angie walks in on Jenny and Kieran drunkenly dancing. Kieran apologizes for accusing Angie of Richard's death, and Angie asks Jenny if they can talk, leading to disastrous results. Remember when I told you that I had cancer? Cancer? Uh, yes. But didn't you say you were getting better? No. This is incurable, inoperable lung cancer. It'll keep growing until it kills me. I want to live, but I don't even know how to anymore. I can feel the doom clock ticking above my head and it's driving me insane. I should make a bucket list like other people do, to live while I still can. But instead, here I am, unable to accept what's coming, desperately trying to cheat death. Angie? Why are you telling me this? I just need a friend, I guess. Angie, are you blind? You really think I'm a good friend material for anyone, let alone someone like you. Look at me. I'm a Hollywood star. I got to the top by sleeping with every man that wanted me, and by destroying every woman that stood in my way. It's in my job description to act like a spoiled fucking bitch, to demand, to take anything I want. And I have no time or desire to be anyone's friend because I know that in the end, I'll have to stab them right in the back. I always do. This isn't the real you. Then what do you know about the real me? You're a drug addict. Jenny. And if you wanted to, you could get help. And you could get better. That'll teach you to mind your own fucking business. Oh, and by the way... I think you made it all up. You don't really have cancer, do you? You just wanted people to feel sorry for you. And that's fucking pathetic, you know. But luckily, George is right there to lend a helping hand. And he listens to Angie pour her heart out. And on top of it, I'm probably losing my mind, because I've seen things. A talking cat from a burned house. Different worlds. Disfigured creatures. But that's probably just my cancer spreading into my brain, because I'm sure it was all in my head. George. I'm just tired. I'm scared. 
and now I'm covered in mud, and I don't even have any clean clothes to put on, and I... George offers Angie a change of his daughter's clothes, ugh, symbolic, and goes to make her a cup of tea. And then, Angie runs into Mr. Fox. He leads her out by the woods and has her dig a hole down to Burnhouse Lane. Angie drops down and finds herself in an old apartment complex. Here, she meets a new friend. I know why you came here. You want the box, don't you? Machowski! You keep saying this isn't a Devil Came Through Here game! So what exactly is Mitzi fucking Hunt doing here? Okay, okay. She says she's forgotten her name, so this might just look like a new quirky character to the uninitiated. But she drops so many references to the cat lady, and we certainly can't ignore the fact that she too passed away from cancer. So in that way, her unspoken backstory very much has a tie to this game. I think her cameo is great, don't get me wrong. I love this redesign of her. Like, she's still sassy and punk rock, but she looks a bit wiser and more, I don't know, tired. <laughs> but I mean, come on, is this a spin-off or not? <laughs> so Mitzi, uh, <clears throat> the girl, tells Angie what she's looking for. She's looking for a black box, and everyone wants it. But Mitzi wants Angie to have it, because she's already seen what's inside and has decided that it's not for her. She even offers to spoil it for Angie if she can guess what vegetable she's thinking of, but she still won't flat out tell you what it is. To access the room with the box, you need to play as one of Angie's cats and find three items that represent things the girls will not live to experience. It's pretty obvious which ones you need to choose, and they're all quite domestic, like having kids and getting married. And although this gives you access to the box, there's a bit of a problem. The box sits right in the middle of a giant spider's nest, and its giant spider starts banging on the door. Mitzi holds the door shut, telling Angie that she needs to run and escape with her treasure. And Angie does so just in time. She awakens back by the river with Mr. Fox. And finally, she's able to open the box. Good. Almost done. smokes this cigarette will receive your cancer. Choose carefully who you give it to. Jenny! Um... I mean, that that's horrible. I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Before they part, Mr. Fox says that one day he'll walk Angie back down to the river, but that now she must make her choice. In the days that follow, Angie's sickness becomes overwhelming, and it seems like she might die soon. She makes one last visit to Burnhouse Lane, where she goes all the way to the end of the street and finds the burned house. Here, she speaks for the last time with the burned cat. Oh, Angie. You should have run while you could. I really hoped you wouldn't see the end of Burnhouse Lane. I tried to catch a little spider to leave him as a present on your doorstep. But he was quick. He stung me. Poisoned me. And now I'm dying. The cat explains that he chose Angie to love and to protect through her journey. So to avenge him and save herself, Angie must face the spider. She also has the chance to free Mitzi from its lair. But who knows? Maybe your next great adventure is just around the corner. Yeah? That's suspicious. So Angie lights up an axe and faces her nemesis for the final time. I don't feel scared or angry. I don't feel anything at all. I've faced my biggest fears and I've conquered them all. What else is there to be afraid of? I'm ready. And now, she can return to the peaceful farmhouse and make her choice. 
Oh, wait! That's not what happens! Instead, there's this last-minute melodrama of Jenny breaking into the meth lab in the basement, and George's fucking original carer holds them hostage with her meth squad, and it's very quickly resolved that they're all friends. I don't really know why the drug subplot existed. It had, like, no thematic weight, and the story would have been largely unaffected without it, but whatever. So now, we can get into our endings. The first two are solely dependent on whether you give your cigarette away or whether you smoke it yourself. And I'm going to start with the ending that I think kind of fits the narrative the best. Angie, Jenny, and George's old carer sit down for tea. Angie and Jenny express a mutual disdain, and Jenny speaks of her plans to move back to LA. Angie goes outside and smokes her magic cigarette before all of her cats. Mr. Fox then walks her down to the river and sends her off in a little canoe. And then we get a little where are they now slideshow. Angie dies on the farm and George regularly visits her grave. Kieran falls in love and gets married. And Jenny returns to her LA life of excess and partying before eventually dying of an overdose. George laments that maybe something could have been done to save Angie, but understands that it was her fight. Now if Angie gives the cigarette to Jenny, she smokes it and leaves the farm the following day. Angie recovers, but feels the crushing weight of her guilt. She travels to Japan only to realize that she was living James's dream and not her own. She calls the farmhouse to see if she could become George's full-time carer, but learns that the house is burned down with George inside. Jenny quickly receives her cancer diagnosis and takes her life with a heroin overdose. At the wreck of the farmhouse, Angie smokes a cigarette. Then, if you save all the lives you possibly can, there's the golden ending. In this ending, Angie miraculously recovers without needing to give her sickness away. She becomes George's permanent carer, and they become besties. And it wouldn't be a golden ending without Jenny fucking dying, would it? I mean, yeah, she was kind of nasty, but goddamn. If I had one complaint, I'd say that the golden ending kind of takes the bite out of the story. Like, we had a perfect setup here with the dichotomy between accepting death and ruining yourself and others because you won't accept it. Spoilers, that's what the game was all about. And with the other two endings, they wrapped that idea up very nicely in a cute little bow, but having the chance to cure Angie's cancer with no consequences... Oh, I'm sorry, it's just a little bit of a cop-out. If we're just looking at it as a reward for players who complete a perfect run, though, it's fine, I guess. Really, it's not that big of a deal. What really made me want to dive into this game was its more kind of down-to-earth human moments. Like that scene in which Angie, Kieran, and George all watch Titanic in the living room, or generally the fact that Angie finds a close friend in an old man. I think this game relied a lot on external sources of horror, when it had something pretty damn solid going on here with its main cast of characters. Like, the scary thing about cancer isn't that it means you need to fight a bunch of serial killers. It's scary because you're going to die slowly and unnaturally and there's nothing that anyone can do to help you. And that's why this game is at its strongest when it focuses on Angie's psyche and how she talks to her friends. Especially because Burnhouse Lane doesn't belong to Angie, it doesn't really reflect her specifically. It's like a buffer between life and death, allowing the person to come to terms with what's happening to them. But if they never come to terms with it, they just rot away and cease to even be human. This is why the burned cat is the way he is. And he still wants to hold on to a person, so he tries to drag Angie down into not accepting her fate. Burnhouse Lane does reach out to Angie. But there's countless people already there, having their own journey. I mean, I love that. I love that we're seeing everyone handle it differently. It just also seems to be setting up a kind of lore that's 
vague enough to fit an entire series inside. The actual street, Burnhouse Lane, I think functions a lot like the Queen of Maggots does in the Devil Came Through Here series. It fits the protagonist in the first game, but it wasn't tailor-made just for them, so it'll be interesting to see if this turns into a new series. The theme of Burnhouse Lane is pretty obvious, so the fun of thinking about this game is interpreting the bloody, morose, serial killer-laden trip. We know where we started, we know where we ended up, now what the hell was all that stuff in the middle? Like the spider. Why spider? Spider death symbol? Well that's what I was thinking, but then the character of Mr. Fox was introduced. He's very much like the grim reaper of this story, so I think the spiders and THE spider more so represent Angie's anxieties. Her apprehensions about dying, if you will because Angie's an arachnophobe. Spiders, to her, mean fear. So I think it's one fear embodying her fear in general. Now, this gets a little muddy when we take into account those conversations with Jenny and Mitzi, where Jenny says she doesn't mind spiders, and Mitzi says she finds a dark beauty in them. If we go with the death symbol idea, this makes sense for both of these characters. Jenny doesn't really treat her body like she fears death. She'd rather just chase the next high even if it kills her. Truly living fast. And Mitzi, of course, has morbid, artsy sensibilities, as seen in the cat lady. So at times it's kind of hard to say what exactly is up with the spider thing. I mean, the spider definitely can't be death itself because Angie kills it in the end shortly before dying. And note also that she only had to fight the spider because she hadn't yet given away her cancer, and so she came really close to death and thus had to face her fear of it very directly. So I think the fear theory is most likely. Now if the spider is Angie's fear of death, then what's the significance of burning and fire? We have the burned cat, we have all those burning lost soul type zombies, and we have the burned house itself. I think the answer is in the burned cat's story. He couldn't accept that he and his owner died in the house fire, so the longer he denies it, the stronger the flames burn him in the pseudo-afterlife until he either reckons with it or is consumed. And this is the fate that all the others suffer. It's also evocative of Angie burning the shit out of her lungs. Burnhouse Lane may not be a perfectly written story, but it still has plenty going for it. Like the atmosphere and environmental storytelling. Angie is, of course, surrounded by death everywhere she goes. Really makes you think what's going through her mind as you travel through all these horrible places. Yet there is always the irony of Angie smoking to save her progress, compulsively stopping to breathe in the smoke that will ultimately kill her. And the surreal horror in this game is just cranked up to the max, like, what the fuck is this? What the fuck is this? What in the McHotton spicy fresh hell liggity split fuck is this? This game is unhinged, and yet it's also very peaceful a lot of the time. You know how the cat lady kind of has this low contrast, almost black and white look, hammering in that sense of colorlessness in Susan's world? Well, in Burnhouse Lane, it always seems to be sundown. Very apt, seeing as Angie is nearing the end of her life. I'm sure that any middle school English teacher will tell you that. The only sunrise I can recall is just before Angie is meant to give her cancer to someone else, suggesting a fresh start. And let's not forget the scene in which Angie smokes her final cigarette. It's winter time, and the farm is in a sort of dormant, even dead state. But it's still lovely. Angie gets to smoke surrounded by her dear little cats, and then she takes a stroll to the river for a nice, pleasant boat ride, and that's how she ultimately goes out. I'm interested to see what's next for Harvester. You probably all know that I enjoy these weird, allegorical adventure games, and it seems like they're already hard at work on their next project. I really hope you guys enjoyed my dissection of the game, and, um, I'm gonna go contemplate, um, the ever-shortening amount of time I have left to be alive. Later, dudes.